Well, good morning once again. Thanks for worshiping with us here at Crossroads, and happy birthday, America. Today, we are wrapping up a five-week series that we've entitled Q&A, where we've been looking at what the Bible says about a variety of topics that were formed from questions submitted from here in our congregation. I hope, as we have, that God's Word has come alive for you more and more as we've wrestled with some pretty heavy topics Topics like theodicy, like if God is so good and powerful, then why is there so much evil and suffering in our world today? We've wrestled with sin and its consequences. We've looked at the value of life and questions regarding the unborn. We've actually taken a look at what God's sacred design and purpose is for sexuality. And our commitment has been to treat every question with respect, whether it's come from a a, a sheer curiosity source or from a sense of deep personal experience and pain. We've been seeking God's wisdom and truth revealed to us in the Bible and also through the way that Jesus lived and loved in his life. We're approaching today's question with the same posture and heart. And, And if you think that the church has been quiet about issues about life and sexuality, you're probably of that same opinion as you hear about topics uh, like today, the topic of mental health. Here's our question for today. What does the Bible have to say about anxiety, depression, mental health, and suicide? Let me once again stress that there are often no simple yes or no answers to complex questions, nor will 30 minutes of time be enough to fully address the nuances and dynamics of such a a very important topic. But we're going to once again provide resources for those who might be wrestling with these issues, as well as for everyone and how we can be equipped to show God's love and grace to, as we care for those who are. I want to stress that there is really no us and them when we relate to the topic of mental health. Let's begin by acknowledging that God created us with physical, spiritual, sexual, mental, and emotional aspects of life that provide us opportunities to reflect his image and character. Each of these aspects of humanity also create vulnerabilities in our struggle with sin and footholds for Satan to try to fulfill his modus operandi, that is to kill, steal, and destroy. Anxiety, depression, and mental illness have been part of the human condition from the very fall. Sin created all kinds of human brokenness. While the church has either been silent or even tried to sanitize the subject of mental health, giving the impression that true or strong Christians don't wrestle with any of those, we actually find many people in the Bible who experienced struggles mentally or emotionally, even felt despondent. Moses, one of the greatest leaders of the Old Testament, under the pressure of leading God's people, who were often described as stiff-necked and stubborn, he exclaimed, the burden is too heavy for me. Go ahead and kill me. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of old, after experiencing a, a huge spiritual victory over the prophets of Baal, he was then threatened by a wicked queen named Jezebel, and he ran for his life and exclaimed, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. David, described as a man after God's own heart, In his poems and songs recorded in the Psalms, he spoke of feelings of total loss of strength, an ebbing away of all that is worthwhile in life, and groaning all day long. Jonah, the first missionary, became deeply despondent when God did not destroy Nineveh, but let them repent. Jeremiah was so profoundly sad that he's known today as the weeping prophet, and he confessed that he wished he had never been born. Naomi, when she lost her husband and two sons, she asked that her name would be changed to Mara, which means bitter. She said that the Almighty had made her life extremely bitter. Leah, well, she suffered emotional stress and trauma from some choices made by her father, the rejection from her husband, and even the feelings of jealousy she had toward her sister, whom her husband loved. In the New Testament, Martha, a dear friend of Jesus, found herself unappreciated, feeling critical and even overwhelmed from the stress of hosting Jesus and his disciples. Peter went out and wept bitterly when he realized that he had, he had betrayed Jesus three times. And Judas was so overwhelmed that he betrayed Jesus that he hung himself. The Apostle Paul mentions that he wrestled and was tormented by a thorn in his flesh. We're not sure if that was mental or physical, but he prayed for God to take it away. And even Jesus himself cried out in despair from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
The company of the anxious, depressed, and mentally unstable is a very noble group. Historical leaders, entertainment leaders, athletes, even spiritual and theological leaders have all at times acknowledged their own struggle with anxiety, depression, even suicidal thoughts. Pastor and theologian Charles Spurgeon, he was very forthright about his extreme struggle with depression, and he wrote this. The mind can descend far lower than the body, for in it there are bottomless pits. The flesh can bear only a certain number of wounds and no more, but the soul can bleed in 10,000 ways and die over and over again each hour. Whether we want to admit it or not, all of us have been numbered among them. Every one of us has known at one time or another the slap of setback, the grief of loss, or the disheartening effects of stress. All of our lips may have spoken words of discouragement. All of our hearts may have felt the pain of depression. To feel these things is human. No one is exempt from feeling anxious, maybe um, inadequate, overwhelmed, or even alone. We have looked at the prayer requests that people submit even here at Crossroads. And in the top two, things that people ask to be prayed for. The first is cancer, healing from cancer. And the second is peace when facing anxiety. It might be helpful to have some working definitions. Anxiety is the fixation or worry on circumstances that lead to feelings of being overwhelmed or even paralyzed. Depression, well, it's a deep sense of loss, numbness, a lack of interest or motivation for things in daily life. It can be caused by events or circumstances as a result of imbalances in the body or a result of mental illness. Both anxiety and depression can wreak havoc in our lives from as minimal as distracting us from our work or important moments to leading to physical and mental and emotional disorders that demobilize us and lead to feelings of hopelessness or despair, even the lack of a desire to live. They are both real and serious. They can be highly stigmatized in the church as a lack of faith. And quickly, uh, cliches start to surface. Statements like, well, you just need to have more faith and pray harder. Or remember, rejoice in the Lord always. Or it's time to stop the pity party and just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or quoting scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The extreme despair and even suicidal ideations that come with anxiety and depression can be difficult to understand. We might all know the occasional bad day or disappointment and discouragement, but people who are diagnosed with mental illness face intense challenges. I am certainly no psychologist or licensed therapist, so... As I prepared this message today, I have relied heavily on my teammates from the Crossroads Counseling Center, several helpful articles uh, that we will share in our sermon resources page, and also from personal conversations with those who have or are currently struggling with anxiety, depression, even those who have attempted suicide or know someone who has. So, So that we can all have a common working understanding of anxiety and depression, let me list several signs and symptoms which may uh, obviously vary from person to person. Here are some symptoms. The feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, or hopelessness. Angry outbursts, irritability or frustration, especially over small matters. The loss of interest or pleasure in most of all normal activities in life like sex or hobbies or sports. Insomnia, tiredness, a lack of energy, reduced appetite, or an increased craving for food. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt, fixation on past failures, blame for things that other people do. There's trouble thinking or concentrating, making decisions or remembering things. Frequent or reoccurrent mention of death, suicidal thoughts, or even suicide attempts. For many people who are anxious or depressed, symptoms usually are severe enough to cause noticeable problems in day-to-day activities like work or school, social activities, relationships. Some might feel generally miserable or unhappy but not know why. People with depression may not recognize or, or even acknowledge that they are depressed. They may not be aware of the signs or symptoms of depression themselves. All too often, people feel ashamed about their anxiety and depression and mistakenly believe that they should be able to overcome it with willpower alone. Thankfully, our culture has become more aware and responsive to issues of mental health. 
If anyone or any group should uh, have understanding, patience, compassion, and respond with support and help, it should be those of us who follow Jesus and are trying to live out biblical teaching. So let me provide first some biblical truths for those who might be struggling with anxiety, depression, or mental illness in some way. And the first thing I want you to know is that you are not alone. We've already seen the prevalent mental or emotional struggle of people in the Bible, and there's others. In fact, research indicates that one in five American adults struggle in some way with anxiety, depression, or mental health. You are not the only one here today that is currently struggling. And I want to reiterate that when we suffer in any way, we are not alone. We learned this earlier from our series, and when we looked at Psalm 139, that there's nowhere that we can go, there's nowhere that we are that is outside of God's presence. God is always with us through the good, the bad, even the ugly of life. Remember those questions David asked in Psalm 139? He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will but not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day. The darkness is as light to you. We know that these are not just literal locations that David is referring to, but also includes states of the heart and also the mind. As difficult as it may be, you can rest and trust in God's presence, regardless of where you are and what you might be facing. And his presence can provide for you strength, peace, help, and hope. And David praised God for this confidently. He said in Psalm 34, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the broken heart and saves those who are crushed in spirit. We see this in the New Testament when Jesus is constantly engaged in caring for, comforting the hurting. He was well aware of his own personal emotions, and he never shied away from expressing them. He was hurt, disappointed, frustrated, anger, and even experienced deep sorrow. He often took time to rest, to to have conversation with his father, to regroup and find the strength that he needed to live out his mission and also to love others well. He always cared for his disciples when they found themselves in the midst of a storm, calming the winds and the waves, but also comforting his anxious companions. He cried when he was at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus, knowing full well of the resurrecting work that he was about to do. In John 14, Jesus promised that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to us who receive him as Savior and Lord. And and the Holy Spirit would be our comforter, our counselor, to be in us, to be with us. He describes the Holy Spirit as the advocate, and he says this, peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Paul was referring to that same Holy Spirit when he wrote these words to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. God knows what you are going through, and he is with you in the midst of it. And he is well aware of how he can and will work in and through your life. So trust him Turn to him, recognize the lies of the evil one that is trying to distract you and fill your mind with the half-truth. I also want to encourage you that this is not your fault. Mental illness might be a result of the sinful choices that Adam and Eve made in the garden. But mental health is not necessarily a, a punishment for sin. It was never supposed to be part of the human condition from the get-go. Sin, all sin, separates us from God. And we must not allow the darkness of sin to overshadow the light of Christ. We must be aware that the devil roams around like a roaring lion. He is trying to devour us, to kill, still, and destroy us. But Jesus came that we might have life 
and have life to the fullest. James in the New Testament gives us these instructions. He says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Our strength, our help, our hope is in trusting God and pursuing him above all things. And that's why Paul wrote to the Philippians these words. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You and I can make choices that will help direct our thoughts, emotions, and actions. We can set our minds on things above, the things of God. And we can allow the truth of God to fill our hearts and mind, not the lies or the deceptions of the evil one. It is a battle, but we have God on our side, and we can rely on his strength, and he will bring about victory. Finally, let me encourage you to rest in God's promises. The Bible isn't afraid to acknowledge and address mental health. A third of all the Psalms are actually laments. These are prayers of desperation to God, mostly from David. He's honest about how he is feeling, and he talks to God openly about it. And almost every time, David ends with a prayer of praise for God's faithfulness, recalling how God has worked in his behalf, rescued him, delivered him, strengthened him, even comforted him. Psalm 13 is one of these prayers of lament. Let me just read it for you. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And then my enemy will say, I've overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love, David says. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. I now want to take a few moments to provide some practical ways that we can all help care for those who might be struggling with anxiety, depression, and even mental illness. As with many uncomfortable situations, we can all feel tempted to ignore, avoid, or even abandon a person who is struggling. But every example of Jesus shows the opposite. He was present, fully engaged. He always had time for people who were hurting in any way, and he deeply cared about the individual. So here's a few things to keep in mind as we attempt to live in love like Jesus in relationship to those who are struggling maybe with anxiety, depression, or with mental health. First, listen. Be a safe person to to talk to by asking open-ended questions that require more than a yes or no answer. Here's a question you might ask someone. How are things going? Genuinely care about their response and do not judge or attempt to correct. Avoid trying to point out the silver lining or saying words like, at least. They might say, I can't believe I lost my job. You might be tempted to respond, well, at least you have more free time. You, You might hear somebody say, I can't believe my son flunked out of college. You would say, well, at least your daughter is successful. You might say, I I can't believe my dog died. You might be tempted to say, well, at least your cat is still living. Those at least or silver lining statements are really not that helpful. Don't tell a person that's struggling with anxiety, depression, or mental health that they shouldn't feel the, the way that they do or that it's wrong to feel the way that they do. Allowing a person to feel heard and understood without being judged is a powerful way to show love. I'd encourage you to be discerning. Someone who's depressed might say things or respond in ways that are trying to control or manipulate you. So be wise and let the Holy Spirit guide you as you engage your ears. The second thing I'd encourage you to do is engage. Someone who is struggling with anxiety, depression, will often try to remain isolated or detached. So invite that person to coffee or lunch or to take a walk, to spend time in nature. Often our presence provides so much more comfort and peace than any words that we could say. 
communicate often through calls or text or even take the time to write a handwritten card just to let the person know that you that they are on your mind. Remind them of God's love and care for them constantly, even creatively. Speak truth to that person in grace and love. Remind them of God's presence as well as his power. Invite them to church. Rebecca McLaughlin, in her book, Secular Creed, points out that women who worship weekly are five times less likely to attempt suicide. She also points out that men are three times less likely to attempt suicide when they worship weekly. The thing I also want to encourage us to do is realize that we can't fix them. Just like a person can't get over heart disease or diabetes, mental illness is a medical and an emotional issue that could require professional help, medication, even long-term treatment. And those are not worldly or secular attempts to help. You know, we don't consider insulin off limits to a diabetic, right? We want to encourage people to seek professional, Christ-centered counseling. These are people who are equipped to help them wrestle and work through the things that they are dealing with, with anxiety, depression, as well as mental health. And we can provide support by maybe providing transportation, providing free child care while they attend their appointments, even provide financial resources if needed. Understand and establish your own boundaries for yourself so that you can be healthy and helpful. I never participated in lifeguard training, but I'm told that one of the tools that that lifeguards are provided with are defense mechanisms so that when they jump into a pool to save someone who's drowning, they can protect themselves and both people don't drown. Caring for someone who is struggling can be very difficult, and that's amplified if they've attempted to harm themselves or have even attempted suicide. I'm going to encourage you to never give up, to stay healthy yourself by having a strong support network for yourself, and to trust God to do what only he can do. Finally, I want all of us to know the signs of self-harm and suicide. People struggling with anxiety and depression are at an increased risk of suicide. And knowing the warning signs of suicide or suicidal thoughts is very helpful. Here are some of the signs. Talking about suicide. Saying, I'm going to kill myself. I I wish I were dead. Gathering means to attempt suicide, like buying a weapon or stockpiling pills or or even uh, doing online research about how to commit suicide. Doing risky or self-destructive behavior giving things away, getting their affairs in order with really no logical explanation, withdrawing from social contact or or wanting to be left alone at long times, feeling trapped or hopeless about a situation, being preoccupied with death, dying, or violence, saying goodbye to people as if they won't be seen again. If you notice any of the above signs, talk to that person and ask them specifically, have you been thinking about suicide or have a plan to do so? There is a higher higher likelihood of attempting suicide if there's actually a plan. Encourage this person to seek help. You can seek help on their behalf by contacting their family, their family doctor, or their mental health provider. Make sure that person is in a safe environment. Remove any weapons or medications or things that could be used to attempt suicide. And call 911 if that person is in danger of self-harm or suicide. If you or someone you know is in crisis, we'd always encourage you to contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. Finally, let me just take a few moments to specifically address suicide, death caused by injuring oneself with the intent to die. In 2020, in America, Suicide was the 12th leading cause of death for all ages, the second leading cause of death for people 12 to 34, and the fifth leading cause of death in people 35 to 54. In 2020, 12.2 million American adults seriously thought about suicide. 3.2 million planned a suicide attempt, 1.2 million attempted suicide, and 45,979 people died from suicide. That's about one in every 11 minutes. In the time I've been talking, three people have not only attempted suicide, but actually been successful, if that's the word we want to use. 
The groups with the highest rate of suicide were non-Hispanic American Indians and non-Hispanic whites, followed by veterans, people living in rural areas, and even construction and mining workers. Young people who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual also have a higher suicide rate than heterosexual peers. Suicide among men is four times higher than women. 79% of all the suicides in 2020 were men. But women attempt suicide three times more than men. Suicide and suicide attempts affect the health and well-being of family, friends, coworkers, and the community of those remain. They often cause shock and anger, guilt, and mental illness of those who loved that person. Often those who contemplate and attempt suicide believe lies like this, that they're all better off without me. No one really even cares about me. They won't miss me. I am all alone. I just can't face my pain anymore. It's, it's way too hard. I'm going to show them how much they hurt me, and they'll miss me a lot more when I'm gone. Or I've messed everything up. My life is over anyway. All of these false statements are similar to the lie that the devil told Eve in the Garden of Eden. They are attempts by the devil to kill, steal, and destroy. We actually have several examples of suicide in the Bible. There's Saul in the Old Testament who fell on his sword in battle. There's Samson who died when he was punishing the Philistines for their attack against him. And of course, there's Judas who hung himself after betraying Jesus. The Bible contains strong truth and dispels the lies that the devil has offered and also God offers hope. And so I want to be sure to speak directly to what the Bible has to say about suicide. The Bible is clear that suicide is a sin. It breaks the sixth commandment, do not murder. Suicide places us in the seat of God who is the author and sustainer of life. God alone created humankind, and we have no right to dispose of that life, whether it's ourselves or someone else for that matter. God alone is the giver and the taker of life. And suicide can be a failure to trust God for his help, his strength, and his hope. It destroys the image of the one in whom we were created in. But I also want you to know that the Bible is very clear that suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Contrary to what most Christians have been taught or even believed, suicide is no different than any other sin. All sin is a dishonor and a disobedience to God's design, purpose, and instruction. And all of us, we learned in week two, we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We have also all been offered mercy, grace, and forgiveness from God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by admitting our own inability to be holy by trusting by faith in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and confessing Jesus as the Savior and Lord of our life. That's why Paul writes these words in Ephesians 2. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. God's saving work covers all the sins that we have committed in the past and all the sins that we will commit in the future. We are instructed to confess our sins to receive forgiveness. But God's grace and salvation is not contingent on us confessing every sin we've ever committed, nor is it canceled if we don't. And that includes suicide. The unpardonable sin everyone often refers to, that phrase is actually found in Matthew 12, where Jesus says these words. So I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit may not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, even in this age or in the age to come. There is no context or other biblical connectedness that would indicate Jesus was speaking of suicide when he made these words. Is it wrong? Yes. Is it forgivable? I hope so. Because if not, then none of us have any chance. I think of suicide and other sins. When I read the words of the prophet Isaiah referring to Jesus when he writes, surely he, meaning Jesus, took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. 
But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We should do everything we can to help minister to those who are hurting, who are struggling, who are anxious and depressed, who are distraught in hopelessness, just like Jesus did and like he would. We must point people to the truth found in the Bible about God's character, his power, his goodness, about the value he places on every person created in his image, about the sacred design and purpose he's given to each of us to reflect his image and trust his wisdom and his ways, to find our identity, our satisfaction, and our joy in him alone, and to live with purpose and power every day. I think about that challenge and that opportunity when I read what Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4. I'd like to close just by you following along as I read these words. Paul says, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart, rather, We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel was veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, meaning the devil, has blinded the mind of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. He made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from ourself. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. I want to encourage all of us to let that truth, the truth about how God loves us and, and, and how he feels about us, the value he has of us, let this just wash over all of us and offer us hope and peace and healing in our hearts and in our minds and to trust him to lead us, to guide us, to guard us, to strengthen us and to protect us. I want to close just by offering a prayer over all of us here today. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Let me offer this prayer in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we worship you as the giver of all good things. You are our life. You sustain us. In you, we live and move and have our being. We are desperately dependent upon you for our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Forgive us, Lord, when we've acted without compassion toward those suffering from mental illness. Forgive us for any judgment that we've expressed toward those who are suffering from anxiety, depression, or suicidal thoughts. Rekindle within your church a spirit of compassion, love, and understanding, and grace toward all who suffer from mental illness. Teach us, Lord, what to do. That what we don't understand regarding spiritual, emotional, and mental health, use your people as a healing balm in our culture and society. Use the sound counsel of believers to point people to the Savior who can heal them. Use your church as burden bearers for those suffering from anxiety, depression, and other stresses in life. Jesus, you are the wonderful healer. Deliver healing power in our community so that none walk in loneliness or darkness of mind. Thank you that you invite us to bring our heavenly burdens to you. And you promise to give us light yoke in return. Heal us as we work to help heal others in your name. We pray. Amen.